Hey everyone, uh, this is a new podcast. As you can see, we're we're three guys. Uh, also, the first podcast is on July 27th. So we had done a previous one and as a test, and I forgot to say the date, and it just went downhill from there, all because of me. But uh, but my name's Chris Woodruff. Uh, everyone calls me Woody. I used to do a podcast way back in the day. No one probably remembers it, Deep Fried Bites, but uh, doing another one now. And I have two great friends that I'm joining up with. So uh, someone take over and introduce yourself. Go ahead, Martin. You're you're way more special than I am. So I give you the floor. Wow, wow, thank you. So uh, I'm Martin. People uh, always call me Martin. <laughs> Not not Woody or anything, so just Martin. Um, I'm a developer advocate at JetBrains. I do a lot of .NET developments. Um, also built MyGit in the past, working on a, another side project to build your flights and all that, uh, which is incredible because I'm using .NET Core there with uh, modern technology, but also I have to talk with SOAP services and really old enterprise-y things. So it's a, it's a good mix of modern and the past. And on that tangent, Khalid, up to you. Okay, my name is Khalid, and people call me you mother. No, uh, no, <laughs> they just call me Khalid, uh, and I'm a JetBrains uh, .NET advocate working with Martin. Uh, hopefully, this podcast is uh, more calorie conscious than your deep fried bites one. Uh, so, uh, don't worry about the calories. Uh, I think we'll be okay. <laughs> it's it's uh, sugar free. Sugar free. Don't eat too much. I can't sugar. say it's not salt free because we're all a little salty sometimes. So, so, uh, so actually, let's just get into the first kind of segment that uh, we want to talk about. Uh, Khalid wanted to talk about Blazor. So, uh, Blazor United over in, in the .NET 8 kind of pre releases. And uh, I'll I'll let Khalid kind of get in the soapbox now. Yeah, it's not so much a soapbox, right? Like for me, uh, for folks that don't know, in .NET 8 Preview 6, um, Blazor is starting to move to more of a unified model. So there's about, for folks who don't know what Blazor is, it's kind of a component-based front-end framework, uh, similar to something like React, right? Uh, where you write components, you can add uh, interactability with those components and you can kind of layer them into a UI. There's a lot of popular component frameworks out there. Uh, things like Mudblazer, uh, Octane is one of them. Uh, Radzen is mm -hmm. one I've been playing around with. Uh, and they all kind of try to bring this kind of component model. But uh, it, it's using it's using the Razor Pages kind of model where you have Razor syntax, C sharp mm -hmm. codes, and then you run it where server side, client side. How, how does that work? Yeah. So uh, Blazor uh, previously, the first iteration of Blazor only had uh, Blazor server side, which was uh, using Signal R to communicate from the back end to the front end to kind of create those client interactions. Uh, but if anyone's ever worked with WebSockets you realize how WebSockets work is they maintain a session on the server, right, in memory. Um, Azure has some things where you can create like a SignalR backplane, which is scaled across like a databa database or some other service. But for all intents and purposes, WebSockets usually exist on a server somewhere to maintain your session. Um, that comes with a lot of positives, but it also comes with drawbacks. Obviously, that session has to exist. So the next iteration of Blazor was really taking advantage of WebAssembly and native bytecode that can execute in the person's browser. The advantage there is you can now deploy your Blazor application to CDNs. Um, everything's kind of mostly, the, the UI part anyways, is mostly running on the client and communicating back to, say, an API. Uh, I know uh, Chris's favorite uh, API is OData. So sure, talk to, to an OData API, right? Uh, or GraphQL or uh, your typical HTTP uh, JSON APIs. So uh, there's advantages there, but the disadvantage there as well is like 
Uh, .NET is a garbage collected language. Uh, it has a pretty hefty runtime. So when you run Blazor uh, with WebAssembly, you have to download all those assemblies, that .NET runtime. That can be really expensive. Um, but they're, they're doing trimming right now of those assemblies, no? Uh, where they essentially it, take out all of the classes and methods that you're not using in your codes and then uh, ship smaller versions of those specific to your application. They are, uh, but uh, last I saw, they were still like a Hello World application with Blazor WebAssembly is about still eight megabytes. Um, I could be incorrect, but that's the last one I saw. Um, so eight megabytes is still pretty hefty. Uh, that's maybe one marketing hero image. I don't know. <laughs> uh, oh, the marketing people get me. It's fine. Um, but you know, that has its disadvantages. So with Blazor United, now there's like essentially four paradigms that exist. Uh, the first two that we talked about, but now we actually can render Blazor server side and push the pre-rendered pages to the client like you would with Razor pages or uh, MVC views. The fourth model is interesting because it's a subset of server side rendering and it's called uh, server streaming. So you still render everything on the server, but as chunks of your pages get completed uh, or processed on the server, they get streamed to the page. So you can kind of, uh, for example, if you're pulling from like a really expensive database query, you can still render the top part of the page. And as the table data comes in, you can stream those HTML elements to the UI. So I, I find that stuff really interesting and a, gives people a lot of options uh, in terms of what the future of Blazor is going to be. Um, so it, it's been kind of exciting, but there's still a couple bugs here and there in the preview that I'm curious how the .NET team is going to solve. But that's kind of an overview of what's happening in Blazor and this kind of Blazor United model. Um, I, I don't know what you folks think. Like, do you think um, Blazor obviously has a lot of hype around it right now? It's probably the thing Microsoft is focusing on the most in this .NET release. Uh, you can definitely see that in the issue uh, tracker when you look at uh, the ASP.NET Core issues. Um, what do you folks think? Do you, have you tried Blazor? Do you like the idea conceptually? Um, do you think it has draw like drawbacks that would keep you away? Like, I'd like to hear your thoughts. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something that might be controversial, <laughs> and you know what? It won't be here. The it first, comes here. It, it comes. Be the last. Um, you know, I I have a really fast internet connection. I think it's like 1.2 gigabit. I mean. I have, it's, it's fast. So my question is at this point where I'll say a, a majority of people have fast internet connections and on mobile, they're getting, they're getting fast also with 5g and 5g enhanced and, and the, uh, all the new, new, uh, technology coming out with networking is there a need to put everything on the client side is to download everything into a browser and interact with uh, the web that way? Because to be honest, I still build razor page, like traditional server side razor page web apps and they still perform very well. Now I do have a few JavaScript libraries that, that I run in the browser, but we're talking a couple hundred K probably of downloads to when you're, when you're kind of bringing everything down. So my question is not that Blazor's bad or anything. I've just, I'm just asking a question do we need all this stuff in the in the client at this at this stage? Is it is it for people to to have to have 
a good developer experience because they want to try something new or should we should we at least acknowledge that what we were doing maybe 20 years ago isn't actually that bad sorry i'm only 20 years old so i don't remember uh 20 oh. years ago i I, but... I think the idea is we should be going back to classic asp <laughs> BB script classic asp yeah <laughs> oh. i never no. actually did that so so but no I, i'm just really asking because you know what as developers we always love hype and we love cool the cool new thing like the shiny penny but the shiny penny always comes with the rusty washers with it. So, so is Blazor a, like, does Blazor bring along the, the downside of client side development? Well, you know, I'd like to hear Martin's point of view since he's someone who works on, you know, a production site, uh, speaker travel, and has he ever felt the need to reach for, like any client side framework, whether it be Blazor, React, Angular, any one of those, or do you feel like you've been able to provide the user experience you wanted with your current skill set? So um, the website itself, I think the first line of code was written uh, over four years ago, um, just before COVID, because I thought, hey, let's build a website where people can book flights just before everything <laughs> locks down. That was the perfect idea, right? Um, so I, I started building that using, um, I think my initial code was actually using Vue, uh, fully client-side framework, where the idea was to do just APIs, have a really rich client-side application, talk to it, and work with that. Um, the reason for that was, I think the reason why a lot of development teams sometimes also pick new technologies, it was because I was interested in how does this client-side stuff work? I want to write a client-side application. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really have a need for that, for everything to be on the client. I also didn't have a particular re reason for everything to be server-side rendered. So that didn't really matter in the end. It was really just personal interests. Let's, let's give this a try. Um, I think a month in, um, after I built the authentication story and the token exchanges and everything you need for good client-side practices where you do authentication, I was like, this is not how I want to proceed because this is taking so much time. I'm going to reuse my classical skill set, which is uh, MVC, Razor pages, and all that. So um, I essentially removed everything, started all over. Uh, I think I just reused the HTML and the styles and started working with MVC and Razor pages and a little bit of jQuery or raw JavaScript in the end. And that works really well. Fast forward uh, those four years until two or three weeks ago, um, I actually had a need for client sites. So if you're building a search engine for flights, you at some point have over 5,000 flights coming back from the underlying search, uh, search engine, and you want people to be able to filter and slice and dice and want, find whatever they really want to be using. And I was thinking, OK, um, up to that point, I've already also been doing that using jQuery. So it would actually bring down, at that point, still 2,000 results in HTML with different CSS classes. And then I would do, use jQuery to essentially toggle visibility of certain classes based on what you were filtering. Worked really well with 2,000 elements on a page. Didn't really work well and fluent enough with 5,000 elements. So you start thinking of, well, how can I solve this? And the first idea was, OK, let's go full client side and use a, uh, yeah, a window or list virtualization, where essentially what you would do is you build the entire list in memory, as, as JSON, for example, and you only render the visible part and maybe a couple of rows uh, before and after that, so you can still smoothly scroll around um, and have that working. So I was thinking, OK, this is a perfect case for client side there. Um, and I started building that, and I ran into a couple of things where I was thinking, OK, this is all of a sudden I'm taking logic that I already have on the server side as well, and I'm taking this to the client side. Is that the right thing? And then I thought back because Khalid is a, is a really big fan of the HTMX library, which is essentially a small piece of JavaScript that you add into your page and that adds a um, number of AJAX calls essentially 
whenever you want to uh, do something interactive. So what you can do, for example, is set on a hyperlink, you can uh, make that an HTMX boost. And what it will do is instead of um, having the actual navigation happen in your browser, it will do the navigation in JavaScript in the backend and just replace the page, maybe insert a nice animation. It looks really cool. But the nice thing there is that if that fails, if there's no JavaScript or the Ajax call fails for whatever reason, it's still a hyperlink and that also will uh, still work. So it's just gradually making the experience um, a little bit more client side like uh, so I started looking into that um, and essentially ended up rewriting the entire search engine using HTMX, where I could reuse all of my server-side skills, but also have this HTMX library make use of uh, whatever the library offers there to make it feel a little bit more rich and interactive, even though the actual rendering is happening on the server right now. So I, I think I, Blazor I, is, is trying to offer that experience as well with components um, and all that, where you can build your application, you don't really have to think about where it all runs in, in the case of Blazor United. Um, but still, it's, it's, a, it's a model. Um, and I think it makes sense to look at whatever your team is building, but also at where your clients are located in terms of what you should be building, where the rendering should happen and all that. Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, and I hate to say this cliche, but we all say it depends. And, and really, <laughs> like, how do you develop an app? It depends. It depends on your requirements and what your user's experience is. If they're on, they're on dial-up, which I don't think anyone's on dial-up anymore, but, but I'm just saying if they're on a slow internet connection, like I have a sister-in-law, I think she gets 50... 50 uh, uh, megabit internet connection, which is for for almost anything is is a horrible makes for a horrible experience to the point where her daughter, my niece, couldn't take a college exam online because the internet connection wasn't fast enough. She's trying to take a summer summer class and she couldn't. So they actually had to come up here. They, they live down in Fort Wayne, Indiana. They had to come up here to Grand Rapids where I live so she could take the test. And so, so like those developers who developed that testing application, that web app, like never thought of people with slow internet connections well, because they probably, they, I mean, we're all, we all have, big pipes and we all have these these very fast computers and but we don't realize that some people are still on second third fourth generation intel processors and and they don't have what we have so we have to really think about think about that yeah i mean it, it's true i i do think also there's an aspect and you I think I heard it a little bit in Martin's story about wanting to use Vue and being interested about it. It's like, as developers, we're spending a lot of time, a lot of resources building solutions, right? So we're always kind of seeking potentially the right answer and the right answer in quotes, right? In air quotes. Um, Sadly, there is no right answer, right? Like technology is so good that literally anything you pick these days will probably end up with something that's workable and passable, right? Um, heck, uh, you could probably run an entire business off Excel or some, uh, you know, notion is really popular these days. Um, so like in terms of finding the right solution, that's going to be difficult. And all of these solutions work to some degree. Um, for me, the way I always look at all these technologies, whether it's HTMX, uh, which I love, uh, full disclosure, I love HTMX, so good. Um, or it's something like Blazor. I think you have to look at the context that you're working within, like the team that you have, the team members you're working with, the risk tolerance of your stakeholders. Uh, can they wait around a year until you build on the latest and greatest? Or do they need that solution tomorrow? 
right? So like sometimes picking technology and picking a solution isn't so much about the technical merits, but it's also about the social aspects of your team and your team's capacity to execute on that technical choice, right? So um, like, yeah, I mean, I think all those things really matter in this context. Uh, I think a lot of people like Blazor because of the component model and the fact that it stays in the C-sharp.net world uh, and they don't have to kind of write too much JavaScript to do the things that uh, JavaScript folks do. My only concern with Blazor from like a choice perspective is are you putting the developer experience before the user experience? Are you sacrificing what your users get potentially for your uh, comfort and your choice, right? Um, but that said, I've seen a lot of teams deliver Blazor solutions very quickly. So if your stakeholders value getting things out the door and don't mind waiting for that loading screen to kick in, that might be a good choice for you, right? So uh, I guess we're all going a roundabout way to just say that it all depends, right? It all depends. <laughs> yeah, we, we should yeah. we should name this podcast the "It Depends" podcast. So it yeah, depends. well, Maybe well, we, we already can... pick we already pick Breakpoint podcast. So I mean, that we have what we have, but but it's right. It, it would be kind of a cool "It Depends" podcast because Maybe. that's it because it really all depends on on lots of different criteria. Some you don't even think about when you're starting a new project. So, I mean, I, I'll give you an, an example. I, uh, I did back in the old days when I was doing Windows phone applications. I built this app for, for um, the MVP Summit is, a, is like a, a gathering of all the Microsoft MVPs. I'm, I'm not one anymore, but we built an app to, for people to put all their evening events into so people could find and, and experience and learn where people were at. And it was an awesome experience to build this with a couple people. And I released it, and all of a sudden, I got just black by European uh, developers, European people using this. They're like, oh, my God, you're using all of our data, which at that time, I think Europe, you had to pay. They had like a meter, and you you would pay for, for data as you consumed it. Martin can can tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong. But, but what I... I was yeah. basically doing is grabbing that list over and over again, not realizing that in America we had like unlimited data, but in other places we didn't. So, so I just throw that out there to make people think about kind of how they're doing things. And, and because you, you may not know some little edge case that you're, that you're causing someone a problem, mm -hmm. a user a problem, not a developer. And developers should have the hardest time, and the users should have the easiest time. It's like a, it's like a uh, seesaw. Like mm -hmm. as we were kids, seesaws one kid, one person's up and one person's down. It should be if if the user experience can be as high as possible which means that the developer experience has to be relatively low and, and hard. So, so I always think about that, the seesaw uh, of everything is I have to make, if I make the user experience 100% easy, it's going to be very hard for me as a developer and vice versa. And I think sometimes, sadly, we've all seen apps where, developers make it totally easy on the developer and extremely hard on the user. So I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with you though. It's like, it's our responsibility as people who build solutions to kind of be um, the barrier of pain, right? Like the pain should stop at us. 
it doesn't mean our developer experience has to be terrible, right? Like .NET has traditionally one of the best development experience stories across the board, uh, across most ecosystems, right? Um, so it doesn't mean like suffering means we're doing a good job, uh, but it also means that us having a great time also doesn't mean we're doing a good job, right? So uh, I think for most people, we should be measuring and talking to our users and our stakeholders and understanding what problems they're trying to, to solve, right, with our software. Uh, and I think when people fail, that's when you get like shadow software in companies where people just use your app to copy the data into an Excel spreadsheet and then <laughs> like never use your app, right? That yeah. happens a lot inside of organizations. So yeah. it's really important to not lose track that um, yeah, user experience should always come before you start focusing on developer experience. Yeah. Uh, so, but Martin, you you've been kind of quiet. What what uh, what's your experience with all this? I'm 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 just gonna nod on this because they're all valid points and they're all uh, points that I wholeheartedly agree with. They're they're good points as well. Well, I just um, learned. I yeah, go ahead, Martin. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think developer experience definitely matters uh, because you still want to have a good cadence in your dev team to get things out of the door and, and make your users happy because that's what you want to do. Um, but also the user is, is the one that will be using the application in the end and you want to build for them as well. Yeah. And there, um, again, it depends on bandwidth, on whether you want to run client side or not, whether you can actually afford to run client side if the bandwidth is an issue, for example, or you have low powered devices, things like that. Um, and based on that, you start building your developer experience story as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I, yeah. And it goes, I, I think we also have to remember this goes beyond development. This goes into like QA and testing. And because we all need to make sure our apps, I mean, just because it runs doesn't mean that it's correct. Like I can have a query that that runs. I'm going to, I'll say a link query run through an uh, entity framework core. And you know what? Sure. That, that query runs and I get something back. But like Martin said, you should only get back the data that you, that you need. And if I send back 10,000 records and the user only needs 20 of them, what good is that query? So, so there's also this, this idea that, that we have to kind of look at the, look at the, the behavior of our applications after we develop them. And I always go back, I'm not going to be a, a shill for JetBrains, but all the, all the tools like dot trace and dot memory. I mean, we have to remember to use all those tools also to make sure that we're, our application is within, within a good kind of a, a boundary that, that we're not causing side effects for our users yeah. or for the people that support our app too. I mean, or for the company, I mean, no one wants to overpay for resources. So I, I just thought of that too. I mean, there's another area that you have to be concerned with because if you're building web apps and they're sitting on Azure and they're costing $20,000 a month in Azure costs, that's not good if they could be $2,000. Yep. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess this is all really interesting conversation and you know, I guess we're getting close to the end of the podcast here, at least for this episode. I think for me, I've learned a couple things. Martin's not from Arkansas. He's actually European, which is really surprising. He keeps yeah, telling right. me he's from Arkansas, but I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't believe him. Uh, but, you know, uh, there's a lot of new technology out there. There's a lot of hype. There's, you know, there's good things about them. But I think folks also need to look at it from, you know, maybe like uh, a conservative perspective about, you know, is it right for them? Um, you know, we talked about Blazor United. We also talked about HTMX. 
Uh, I think both of those technologies have their strong points. Both of them have kind of their drawbacks. I, I would urge people to look at both of those things. Um, you know, the thing that underpins them all is ASP.NET Core, which I think is kind of a great web stack uh, all in all. And uh, the things I learned from you, Chris, and Martin about how you apply these things, uh, those are really cool too. So yeah, yeah. Thanks, for, wow. thanks for having this conversation. Yeah, I mean, it, and, and this is what we're going to be doing. This is what this podcast is. It's just going to be us start at a starting point and see where we where we go uh so we want ideas we kind of want feedback if you if you agree with us great but if you don't agree with us i actually like when people don't agree with me and tell me that because one i only learn when people tell me their views and i'm not going to say their views are right or wrong against mine. I'm just going to say everyone has a different view. And the only way that I'm going to learn is by hearing everyone's view. So, so please like in the comments or, or on the website, there's going to be ways for people to contact us. Like, tell us, tell us what you like, what you don't like, what you want to see in the future. Um, uh, what you want us to talk about, what don't you want us to talk about? Um, if you want Martin to talk more during an episode, that that's great also. But uh, but remember, go out we, to uh, we people in Arkansas are really really shy. I know they're really shy in Arkansas. <laughs> that thick yeah. Arkansas accent is uh, it's hard <laughs> yeah. to decipher. Yeah, up in the mountains of Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> but go out to our website breakpoint.show. It's not a .com. It's breakpoint.show. And and take a look and, and kind of we'll be doing this every couple weeks. Not going to say that we're going to be a perfect cadence every two weeks, but we're going to try to do it every two weeks. And uh, but if something big comes up, we may do it on a more timely basis. So it all depends on what you tell us to do. All right. So Bye, everybody. Okay. Okay, say goodbye, Martin. Bye. Okay. Yeah, bye, everyone. Okay. <laughs>